I had never heard that song before. None of you have. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Lisa, for arranging that. Mm. So the holidays are here. Blink. <laughs> Christmas. Thanksgiving. There's a line in that song about bones, dead bones. Uh, yeah. Bones, bones. Bringing yeah, bring these bones to life. Bringing these bones back to life. And as I was sitting there taking the song in, I so resonated with that moment because I know I'm not alone, but sometimes when all of a sudden the holidays come upon us, it's almost overwhelming. And it's like, oh my God that on top of everything else I already do. And I want to take a giant step back and go, stop, right, pause. And yet, when I lean in and I use my spiritual practices, when I use the teachings and the practices that I learned here, I can show up. And I can show up differently than the fear. The fear that sometimes overtakes me. You know, I know that you all know something about me. <laughs> and I know something about you. I know something very specific about you. Each and every one of you. Whether you're here for the first time or you come a lot. I know that we also all know something about everyone on the planet. And that thing is that everyone's goal, each and every person's goal, is to be happy. That's what we all long for in this life, and it's why others put up with all of our stuff. It's why people endure difficult situations and hardship, because they're striving for happiness for themselves or their family or their loved ones. That longing, that desire for happiness is even enshrined in our founding document by Thomas Jefferson where he talks about the pursuit of happiness being endowed by our creator, by the oneness, the God that stands under all manifestation. So it's really amazing that this country and as a community we actually have a day for gratitude, for thankfulness, because there is true scientific correlation now that the idea that actually living a life of gratitude, a practice of gratitude, creates happiness, creates happiness for you. Uh, recently, I, um, well, it wasn't recently, it was almost a year and a half ago now. Like, a year and a half ago, we went to, together, some of us went to a Byron Katie workshop up at Spirit Rock. And it was an amazing workshop of people getting up to do the work. But there was also an opportunity for some question and answers from the audience there. And I was called to get up and ask a question. I asked, you know, I really appreciated all the discussion that they were having around family and what it was to be a parent and how to let expectations go in that journey. But I still had this thought, this feeling, that it was my job, my job, to teach myself, my son, something. At the time my son was 17. And so Byron, in her wisdom, looked at me and said, well, if that were true, that that was your job, what would you want to teach him? And I looked at her and said, well, if I knew that, I'd be a lot more successful at it. <laughs> but she wouldn't let me off the hook, and she kept pressing, so what is it that you want him to know? What is it that you want to teach him? And finally I came up with the answer that I want him to be successful. I want him to have the tools and the practices that lead him to a successful life. And again, she wouldn't let me off the hook, and she said, what does that mean? What does success mean? and I thought inside and I went, I want him to be happy. I want him to be happy. And 
she looked at me and said, well, if you want to teach him how to be happy, isn't the best way to be happy yourself? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> you mean yelling at him won't get that point across? <laughs> Calling him bad and wrong won't do that. And so I was there in this, this perplexing dilemma because I had been practicing unity uh, spirituality and doing the inner work in my 12-step program, in my spiritual program, and I had, I thought, achieved this equilibrium. After all, I'm Reverend Ken, the senior minister director. <laughs> and this 17-year-old boy knocked me off that pedestal so easy. <laughs> By fall, jump. <sighs> and in that humbling moment, I get to be back in my practice, back to square one, back to an understanding of what gratitude is. So we've talked about two things here. I've talked about happiness and I've talked about gratitude. And you know, it might be really easy to say, well, that happy people or successful people can easily be grateful. But all the research shows that it actually works all the opposite way. And let me ask you this. Do you know really successful people, right, that aren't happy? <laughs> because there's something in the striving for success or striving for happiness that keeps you always striving, always seeking, always wanting more, more of the thing that you quantify as success, whether it be material or a relationship or a position. If you achieve it, when you get there, you go, oh, well, I need this now. And you're constantly going forward more and more. A practice of gratitude is different in that it anchors you in the now moment. That breath of in this moment, I am grateful for everything around me. And here's the divine paradox. When you can have a goal in your life, but also be completely content and grateful for everything you have in the moment. This constant seeking ceases. And you can establish goals without constantly feeding that monkey mind of more, better, larger, greater. When you can breathe into the now moment and establish a practice of knowing that there that God, that the almighty one power is at work in this moment, is supporting you. It becomes transformative for yourself. And people who have a practice of gratitude, grateful people, are more successful, get better sleep, have better relationships, and are achieve, able to achieve more in their life. So as we go through this holiday season, I think, I know I'm going to do it, I think it would serve us all to go through with a really strong practice of gratitude, to take this opportunity to be in the week of Thanksgiving and make it a practice that is sustainable and transformative for all of our lives. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the practice of gratitude. Because gratitude is actually, and happiness, are actually emotions. And they're, that's all I have. Gratitudes are emotions. Happiness is emotions. Right? It's an emotional feeling. You have an experience of gratitude. So they're fleeting. Like all emotions, they change. They shift. So it's, if you're depending on your practice of gratitude for some external reminder that you're supposed to be grateful, you're going to come up short in the practice because it's not able to constantly to sustain. But there are a couple tips that you can do uh, to help anchor that in. I want you to think about something for a second. I want you to think about something that you've been given, a gift. Something that you didn't have to earn, you didn't purchase, you didn't trade, something that you were just given. 
Can you conjure that up? How do you feel about it? Does it feel good? This thing that you're given? Ah, I see some heads nodding, right? Right? This just pure gift of, of abundance in your life. And we've been talking this whole year about abundance, what it really means. There's a real feeling of gratitude when you realize something is so freely given to you, so freely in your life. You didn't have to struggle for it. You didn't have to fight. You didn't have to work hard. You didn't have to bargain. Because when we work hard, there's always this little thing in our minds of, did I do enough? Do I deserve? When we bargain, we diminish the value of everything in the negotiation sometimes. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And when we trade, we're then locking in its value. This is worth this. But when something is truly a gift, Lisa sending it, everything's a gift. You're going to be incredibly grateful for it. Incredibly aware that you did nothing to earn this and that the universe that God keeps showering you in every moment of every day with more and more and more blessings. Think about it. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the walls. It flooded 80% of the city. 1.5 million people were without homes, without running water, without electricity, and they were dispersed all over the country. Some of them my family, some of them living in my house, where they could go and flip on the light switch when they came in. They could go over and turn on the water faucet and have drinkable running water in the house. Right now in Puerto Rico, Three million people are going through the same experience. All of a sudden having to know the incredible gift of being able to turn on a light switch and get light, of opening a tap and getting drinking water. Should we put stickies on our faucets and on our light switch that reminds us to say thank you? Did you do anything that really to create running water? Has anyone here invented the idea of indoor plumbing? <laughs> right? But we have it every day. When it doesn't work, we get upset. But every day, we have this incredible gift of electricity, of light, of comfort, of fans, of water, of sustenance of our lives. There are a million miracles in your life right now. The clothes I'm wearing, the friends I have, the support as I was running around today, Misa and I were trying to figure out the song, seeing if we could figure it, if we could actually pull it off. It was crazy. My two kids were climbing over me because they wanted to sing with me. <laughs> yeah, they were, and then they would cry when I wouldn't let them. And uh, I looked around at that moment, feeling the stress of the children, because now it's not the now 19 year olds, not the teenager, it's the four year olds and the two year olds that are keeping me off the pedestal. Let's just put it that way, keeping me off the pedestal. Right? And I looked around and there was a whole team handling everything. People who were handling the sound and the PowerPoint and the check-in and getting the kids program ready and the music and the staff upstairs, making sure that everything was flowing. It's like, what do I have to stress about? What do I want to take on as a human being, thinking that it's not supposed to be this way? It keeps me from being in gratitude. Those things, those things, keep us from knowing our true power. And when I say our true power, I talk about it from a unity and a new thought perspective. Right? Our teaching, and we're going to have a whole lesson on this line next week, is that there is only one power and one presence in the universe. One power and one presence. That presence I happen to call God. You may prefer spirit, 
you may prefer the term universe. Whatever it is that you prefer, that one power and presence is all that it is. All that I am. Because if I'm in the oneness, this representation of physical form is completely made out of God stuff. <laughs> completely made out of God stuff. Right? There's no separation from you and the divine except that you think that you're not. That you've turned your back on the divine and you think it's not part of you because you can't see it. A practice of gratitude allows you to see the divine. See it in your friends and your family. To see it in everything around you. You know, A Course in Miracles teaches us that there is only love or fear. And that the process of miracles is that. A shift from fear to love. Well, I know that the shift from stress or fear to gratitude is a process that reveals the miraculous already at work in your life. Already you are showered with incredible blessings. But we just forget to notice them because they are like the light switch. They're like the tap water. We don't begin to see them anymore. So I have a couple of suggestions for us this week. A couple of ways that we can develop a practice of gratitude. As I mentioned, gratitude is a fleeting emotion. So a practice of gratitude is essential to living a life of gratitude. So two things I'm going to suggest. We all learned this when we were kids. How do you cross the street? If you stop first, right? Then you look. And you listen. And then you go. You can listen, too. <laughs> stop, look, listen is another one. But to cross the street, you have to stop. You have to look. And then you go. Then you choose which way to go forward. Or where to wait. But you make that choice in the moment. So I'm going to ask you, as you go through your life for the next couple of weeks, months, to practice stopping. Now, it happens to us all the time, right? Who has to stop on a red light on their way here? <laughs> Who has to stop and wait for the bus? Who has to stop and wait for someone else to cross in front of you? When you go to the grocery store, do you have to stop and wait in the line to check out? All these stops are built into our lives. And we treat them as an inconvenience. <laughs> we treat them as something, oh, or that's an opportunity for our monkey minds to go crazy. Pull up to the traffic light, stop and wait. I'm going to be late. This traffic light saying you can be late. This traffic light's the problem. That person who's walking across the street so slow. <laughs> right? How about, <laughs> oh, some other people do that too. <laughs> How about if we walk up to the traffic light, stop and actually look at what's around us. Look at the beautiful old lady or old man crossing the street. Look at the little kids playing on the corner. Look at the gorgeous vehicle that you're driving. Look at the old vehicle that keeps running. <laughs> right? What if you were to walk into the line at the grocery store, and when you get there and it's 10 people deep, instead of pulling out your phone and answering another email, or searching the web for the latest tweet from Donald Trump, huh. <laughs> so that you can get more upset, <laughs> that you actually just paused and prayed to develop in those moments a way of practicing stop. Look at that basket of food that I was able just to pick up off the shelves and take home with me. What an amazing gift. You know, there are millions and millions of people who don't shop that way around the world. Right? That's not how they get their dinner. The gift of it. The abundance of it. The prosperity of it is all around us. How about at the end of the day, 
when your body tells you it's time to stop. That you do then take out your phone and make a gratitude list of three things. Three simple things that you're grateful for in that day. And text it to your prayer buddy, or to your best friend, or to your spouse, or to someone across the country or across the world who might just be waking up that day. And let you know three things that you're grateful for. And there's some really interesting social science around this and psychology around it. They ask that you only do three things. Don't make your gratitude list ten things. Three things. And you know why? Because our human mind is a really funny thing. We think if we can come up with three things and write them down, that was easy. And we think, wow, I'd live a great life. But if you set your goal that you want to find ten things you're grateful for every day and have to list those ten things, you might have to struggle to come up with them or repeat. And then our minds start to think, well, oh, see, wasn't too good a day. <laughs> I couldn't come up with ten. We be crazy. <laughs> We'd be absolutely crazy. But to know that, to know that, keep it simple. In 12 Step, we have a, a, a saying, it's, it's not very politically correct, but it's keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> right? Because we have a tendency to let the mind spin and to talk ourselves out of our good. To keep it simple is a way, and, and I like better, keep it simple, sweetheart. <laughs> Keep it simple, sweetheart, so that we can be present to what it is. A gratitude practice may seem simplistic, but it is the most powerful tool for transforming your life. That you can start without any guru, without any special skills, without anything, and have better relationships, have better work, make more money, have better relationships with your employees or with your boss, whichever way you sit in that in that arena with your co-workers. Having a practice of gratitude allows you to shift from the fear to the miraculous, from the lack to the bounty. As we enter this season of giving and receiving, of gratitude and of hope, know that a world filled with gratitude, a community filled with the gratitude practice, will transform everything they touch. That energy, that knowing, and that peace will lift us all. And I'm grateful for it all. We sang, all that I am, all that I see, all that I've been, and all that I'll ever be. It's a blessing. It's so amazing. And I'm grateful. Grateful for it all. Let's take this to our time of meditation. One of our songs that we're going to use today is Karen Drucker's